the combat that raged over European skies during World War II has often been described as a battle between fighters and bombers. Historians often dismiss the impact of German anti-aircraft defenses. In fact, the German Flakwaffe or the anti-aircraft arm made a major contribution to the defense of Germany and at least half of the American aircraft shot down over Germany was due to Flak. Anti-aircraft fire had two important roles to play. One was to bring down enemy aircraft, while the more important one was to force the bombers to drop their bombs sooner or from a higher altitude, thus reducing accuracy. Flak also damaged thousands of Allied heavy bombers, causing them to break formation and lose altitude, making them easy pickings for the German fighters. From the beginning of the war, the Germans had in place some of the most effective anti-aircraft guns in the world. The most infamous one was the 88mm Flak 41. The arrival of the 8th Air Force in the spring of 1942 did not immediately tip the balance in favor of the Allies. Instead of having to exchange the Royal Air Force at night and relying on gun-laying radar, the Flakwaffe would soon have a large number of targets with which they could engage using optical sights. The United States Army Air Force held strong in their belief that daylight precision bombardment held the key to victory. While the Americans focused on bombing individual factories and other important targets during the day, the Royal Air Force stuck to their night bombing strategy. Unfortunately for the eight Air Force crews, the United States Army Air Force focused their resources on the idea of a self-defending bomber. Little or no thought was given to the danger of flak. Equipped with sophisticated powered turrets and flexible guns, the B-24 and B-17 were thought to be more capable of defending themselves against fighter attack, bombing the target and returning home. The possibility of being shut down or damaged by flak wasn't really considered. In August of 1942, the US 8th Air Force launched mission number one. Escorted by Royal Air Force Spitfires, 12 B-17s attacked the Ravel Marching Yard in France. Bombing from 23,000 feet, the mission was a success with no losses. By the second half of 1942, the 8th had grown to six bomber groups. By the end of 1942, 30 daylight missions had been flown with limited results. Losses were light and optimism was high. Most United States Army Air Force commanders downplayed the threat of flak, but not everyone was in agreement. The pivotal year in the European War was 1943, with the first major German defeats altering the strategic balance. The German surrender at Stalingrad in February and in North Africa in May along with the first notable victory against the U-boats in the Atlantic, finally gave the Allies the initiative. Hitler continued to champion the Flakwaffe and wanted more guns to defend the Third Reich. Because of the loss of personnel in Africa and the Soviet Union, the Germans were forced to use young men in the Flak arm. By the end of June 1943, 
there were 1089 heavy plug batteries compared to 660 in January. Flux gun production had almost tripled between 1941 and 43. The Flakwaffe's first line of defense was the numerous gun batteries located on the coast of the Netherlands and Low Countries. Flying directly over the Netherlands was known as the Bomber Autobahn or the Bomber Highway. German flak gun batteries employed three different methods of fire control against high-flying heavy bombers. Continuously pointed fire, predicted concentration of fire, and barrage fire. Continuously pointed or predicted fire relied on both good visual and gun-laying radar acquisition of the target formation. This type of fire was designed to place shells directly in front of the lead aircraft in the formation. The guns would fire a continuous pattern of bursts along the aircraft's course and each battery would maintain fire until the formation was no longer in range. New batteries would then join in once in range. Predicted concentration of fire was less effective. Used at night through cloud cover on where radar information was of minimal quality, it needed the incoming formation to fly straight the level for about 90 seconds in order to come into effect. A master command post directed the fire of several batteries at once. Each battery was informed and adjustments made so the concentrated fire would strike the point of prediction at the given time. The least effective tactic was barrage fire. This was primarily used at night or when cloud cover prevented good visual aiming and it was designed to put as much flak into a certain volume of sky or box. The box was usually placed just outside the expected bomb release line of the incoming formation. By late 1943, the United States Army Air Force began to take the science of flak analysis seriously. The number of heavy bombers shot down and damaged was increasing, forcing a change in tactic and the use of electronic countermeasures. In November of 1944, the 8th Air Force Operational Analysis Section produced an in-depth study titled An Evaluation Taken to Protect the Bombers. The results were sobering. The percentage of bombers lost to or damaged by enemy fighters had declined sharply, while the percentage lost to flak has declined only moderately, and the percentage damaged by flak had remained constant. As a result, there had been a steady increase of the relative importance of flak until August of 1944. Flak accounted for about two-thirds of the 700 bombers lost and 98% of the bombers damaged. All the efforts to reduce flak damage have apparently been offset by the fact that we have increasingly flown over targets defended by more and more guns. Further equipment, gunnery and ammunition have probably improved. Avoiding flak over flak defenses en route to and from the target, enter and leave the target area on course, which cross over the fleekest flak defenses in the shortest time possible, fly at the highest altitude consistent with other defensive and offensive considerations, 
plan and spacing the axis of attack of bombing units to make the fullest use of radio countermeasures were the tactics which were offered by the study. The February of 1944 saw the Flakwaffe swell to a wartime high of 13,500 heavy flak guns and 21,000 light flak guns. The highest concentration of weapons was in Germany. The increase in the numbers did not necessarily translate directly to more aircraft being shut down. Part of the reason for this was the increased use of electronic countermeasures. The D-Day invasion in June of 1944 and the liberation of France signaled the end of Germany's air defense network. Following the invasion, the 8th Air Force turned its attention to German oil facilities. In response, the Luftwaffe was forced to move their flag guns to defend those sites. Guns were relocated from Berlin and the Ruhr, unfortunately leaving some towns and cities defenseless. The attack of German oil plants led to a sharp increase in the number of United States Army Air Force casualties. During attacks against the Loina oil facility alone, 82 US bombers were shot down, with Flak accounting 59 of them. Between June and August, the United States lost 654 heavy bombers, with more than 14,000 damaged. At this time, Flak was inflicting 10 times as much damage as the fighters. By January of 1945, the end of the war was in sight. However, even in its diminished state, the Flakwaffe could still deal a deadly blow to Allied air forces. In the end, the Flakwaffe proved its worth. Between July of 1942 and April of 1945, the 8th Air Force lost 1,798 heavy bombers to Flak, with the 15th losing a further 1,000 between November of 1943 until May of 1945. In themselves, the Flak defenses could not successfully defend German airspace. However, Without the thousands of heavy and light flak guns defending Germany, German cities and factories would have been quickly blasted into ruins. While the 8th Air Force contributed a great deal to the final victory in Europe, General Henry Hepp Arnold noted, We never conquered the German flak artillery. I hope you like this episode and to make sure you don't miss my future work, please make sure you are subscribed to my channel and press the bell notification button. Thank you and see you in the next video.